Does blood play a role in hair growth? Is it even a factor worth considering when it comes to your hair? In this video, we'll look at all the evidence when it comes to blood and hair growth and lay out both sides of the argument. Okay, let's get started. Interestingly, subcutaneous blood flow in the scalp is up to 10 times higher than any other area of the body. This blood flow comes from branches of the external and internal cartoid arteries, which eventually give rise to countless smaller vessels that pass through the scalp's fatty layer. While the scalp itself rarely suffers from blood supply issues, the hair follicles on it are vulnerable to damage, even from short-term blood flow problems. There's nothing specific to hairs in the scalp, it also applies to other parts of the body. For example, in a medical condition called peripheral artery disease, the arteries in the legs become compromised due to the buildup of plaque. As a result, blood flow to the legs is reduced and hair loss is one of the early signs that something is wrong. Under normal conditions, healthy terminal hairs in the scalp are supplied by a very rich network of vessels. But miniaturized hairs in advanced baldness are very poorly vascularized. In line with this, researchers have found that men with AGA have around two and a half times less subcutaneous blood flow compared to healthy controls. This reduction in blood flow does not affect the entire scalp, but only the areas that are prone to balding. Skin on the side and back of the scalp, which does not go bald, receives a normal supply of blood, even in men with advanced baldness. In contrast, men without hair loss don't show this difference, and their blood flow is the same across the various areas of the scalp. It's very likely that this reduction in blood flow affects the follicle's ability to perform its normal functions. And when the blood flow drops below a certain level, its ability to synthesize keratin, the basic building block of the hair shafts, becomes severely compromised. This is reflected in the degree of vascularization in the hair follicle during the various phases of the hair growth cycle. During anagen, when the hair shaft is actively growing, the vessels supplying the follicles are approximately four times more extensive compared to the telogen phase when hair growth stops. You can see in this microscopic image just how rich the vascular network surrounding the hair bulb is during anagen phase. This is also important because we know that alterations in the hair loss cycle is one of the key features of androgenetic alopecia. The follicles switch from spending most of their time in anagen to telogen, suggesting the possibility of a vicious feedback loop. In other words, it's possible that the change in their hair cycle dynamics leads to a semi-permanent reduction in blood supply. This in turn might further impair the follicle's ability to resume their normal cycle. Topical minoxidil helps reverse this impairment by dilating the blood vessels and restoring the flow of blood to the scalp. The major problem with minoxidil is that the effect is very short-lived, peaking around the one hour mark after application. This is probably why most minoxidil formulations require twice daily application and also why whatever regrowth you get from minoxidil will also probably be very mild. And you can't just keep upping the frequency of application or the strength of the formula because you'll very quickly just run into side effects. Hair transplants are an interesting case study. In hair transplant patients who do not take finasteride or any other hair loss treatments, those transplanted hairs typically last about five to 10 years before they too start thinning. All the while, the donor area on the back and sides of the head, which studies show have more blood flow, stay perfectly strong and healthy. This directly contradicts the idea of donor dominance and genetic resistance to DHT. Transplanted hairs will start to thin if treatments aren't used. So is it pure coincidence that this study modeled tension in the scalp and found that the pattern of high tension correlated almost perfectly with the pattern found in male pattern baldness. Scalp tension and the first areas to start balding are clearly overlapped. Let's take a look at another case study, PRP. PRP, which stands for platelet-rich plasma, is a treatment 
where a part of the patient's own blood is injected back into the scalp. It involves drawing a small amount of blood from the patient and processing it to separate the plasma part, which is rich in platelets from the rest of the blood components. The platelet-rich plasma, which contains growth factors, is then injected into the scalp to stimulate hair growth and improve the health of the follicles. Although PRP is prohibitively expensive for most people, it is typically a very effective treatment. A 2020 review study looked at all the published evidence and concluded it regrows on average 33.6 new hairs per centimeter squared. This is more than double finasteride monotherapy at 15.9 new hairs. So we see that taking a part of our own blood and injecting it into the scalp works effectively to improve hair growth. And yet some people still believe that microvascular blood supply plays no role in hair growth as the doctors who pioneered the use of Botox for the treatment of male hair loss wrote, the scalp behaves like a drum skin with tensioning muscles around the periphery. These muscle groups can create a tight scalp when chronically active. The quote continues, because the blood supply to the scalp enters through the periphery, a reduction in blood flow would be most apparent at the distal ends of the vessels, specifically the vertex and frontal peaks. Conceptually, Botox loosens the scalp, reducing pressure on the perforating vasculature, thereby increasing blood flow and oxygen concentration. This is why relaxing the perimeter scalp muscles with Botox injections was found to regrow impressive amounts of new hair. Unfortunately, the downsides of PRP and Botox injections is that they are expensive. They require a visit to the clinic and involve multiple injections. Scalp massages are another way to improve the condition of the scalp by increasing blood supply and reducing fibrosis. Firstly, massages around the perimeter of the scalp help to reduce muscular tension. They also help to remodel fibrotic tissue, which has built up over time, both of which can improve circulation in the balding areas of the scalp. However, most people simply don't consistently stick with scalp massages because they're simply too tiring and time consuming. Luckily, there's another way which involves a device called a grow band to do it all for you. Designed specifically for improving hair growth, the grow band massages the entire scalp and can be used in a hands-free and fully automated way, making it easy to use consistently and hence easy to get results. The grow band pushes upwards, reducing muscular tension around the perimeter of the scalp. Additionally, this upward pressure causes creasing and pinching at the top of the scalp, which triggers scalp tissue remodeling. This helps reduce the fibrotic buildup that essentially strangles the hair follicles. The grow band has gained massive popularity recently and it's only available on hairguard.com. Head over to learn more about it and see the user's results. Blood flow clearly matters for the growth of the hair follicle. Improving blood flow along with blocking DHT are the two main mechanisms through which the hair can be most effectively regrown. Although the grow band can be successfully used as a standalone option, the best results will likely come from combining with a DHT blocker, either topically or orally. Okay guys, please let me know what you think in the comments. I'll try my best to reply. Like and subscribe to the channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.